annals of criminal history, few figures are as enigmatic and chilling as Julia Tofana. It wouldn't be too surprising to learn that some of you may not be aware of who this woman is, but by the conclusion of this short documentary, you'll discover that Julia Tofana is one of the most infamous poisoners of the 17th century. Her story, woven into the fabric of historical crime, is one of cunning, mystery and deadly expertise. Tofana, credited with the creation of the lethal poison known as Aqua Tofana, is believed to have been responsible for the deaths of hundreds, if not thousands of individuals during her active years. In today's video, we are going to be exploring the socio-historical context of her actions, the composition and impact of her infamous poison, and the enduring legacy she has left in the realm of criminal folklore. This is the story of Julia Tofana. Julia's early life is a tapestry of mystery and conjecture, with very few documented facts available on her. She was born in 17th century Italy, with experts believing her city of birth was Palermo, Sicily, though this has never been able to be factually confirmed. Throughout the course of her life, Italy was a patchwork of city-states and principalities, each with its unique blend of political intrigue, social norms and religious fever. The Catholic Church wielded significant influence, and its doctrines often dictated societal norms, particularly regarding the role and rights of women. Marriages were frequently arranged for political and economic reasons, with little regard for personal choice or even happiness. In this era, women were relegated to subservient roles, with limited legal rights and almost no control over their destinies. These societal circumstances would play a key role in the creation and success of the poison Julia would go on to create. The cornerstone of Julia Tofana's infamy was her creation, Aqua Tofana. This poison was colourless, tasteless and, most importantly, undetectable with the forensic technologies of the time. It is believed to have contained compounds like arsenic and belladonna, among other poisonous ingredients. The genius of Aqua Tofana lay not just in its lethal efficiency, but also in its method of deployment. It was designed to be administered in small, incremental doses, making the victim's eventual death appear to be due to natural causes. The symptoms included by Aqua Tofana such as gastrointestinal distress, weakness and eventual organ failure were common to many natural diseases of the time. The gradual deterioration made it difficult for physicians to identify the true cause of death. The slow nature of the poisoning meant that victims had a chance to get their affairs in order and their wives were there to exert their influence over what the order looked like. And the deaths those tragic young lives lost to their sick beds were never believed to be anything more. It's not clear if Julia was operating a business as there are no historical accounts of such information, but she did have a very effective method of brewing, bottling and distributing it to those who were in need of it. So the most likely premise is indeed through some sort of business, but as mentioned, there is no clear and concrete information on it. The poison became extremely popular with women who, at the time, had little to no rights and were married into politically positioned marriages with little say-so. Aqua Tofana became a very effective way to rid these unhappy women of their husbands without cause for concern due to the poison only needing to be administered in small doses. Given the illegal and dangerous nature of her business, Tofana operated with the utmost discretion. Transactions and communications with clients would have required a high level of secrecy to avoid detection by the authorities. It's likely that Tofana's business grew through word of mouth within circles of women who shared similar plights, 
building trust with her clients would have been crucial as both the buyer and seller were at significant risk. Some historical accounts suggest that Tafana may have used legitimate fronts for her business, such as selling cosmetics or apothecary products to mask her poison trade. This would not only have provided a cover, but also a plausible means of distributing Aqua Tofana, perhaps disguised as a cosmetic or medicinal product. However, as I previously mentioned, there just isn't enough credibility behind such claims. The poison became best known as a husband killer. Flocks of women wanting their freedom came to Julia and it wasn't long before an array of death across Rome caused people to take notice. The widespread knowledge of Akutofana's existence and its undetectable nature induced fear and paranoia, particularly among the upper classes. Husbands became suspicious of their wives and public anxiety about poisonings increased. The end of Julia Tofana's nefarious activities marks a dramatic and pivotal moment. Her downfall in the late 1650s was the culmination of a career that had, until then, successfully evaded the grasp of law enforcement. The details surrounding her capture and the subsequent events are mirrored in historical ambiguity, with different accounts providing varying narratives. Basically, nobody knows for sure what happens to her, but I do have several recorded accounts from sources referencing Julia's fate and be warned, they all differ slightly from each other while holding similarities. One widely cited account suggests that the unravelling of the Fana's operation began when a client, having purchased the poison, had a crisis of conscience. This woman, reportedly, did not go through with the poisoning and instead confessed to her husband, who alerted the authorities, which resulted in Tofana's capture. Another account, far more theatrical than the previous one, stated that a woman, after administering Aquatofana to her husband, was struck by guilt and confessed to him before the poison could take effect. The husband, in turn, reported this to the authorities, leading to an investigation. A third account of her capture was down to tip-offs and suspicion of Julia from men who had noticed the increase in high-profile deaths of individuals in leading roles. These were traced back to Julia through integrating women who had visited her, resulting in her capture. There is also a completely different account that stated Julia evaded capture completely and went on to live in a non-sanctuary, living out her days in solitude. I'll let you guys decide for yourself what story you want to believe, but the most credible piece of information on record is that Julia was indeed captured and confessed to the killing of over 600 men. What's just as shocking as this high number is that, if indeed it is true, it reflects just how in demand her services were, further highlighting just how bad the societal and marital issues were at that time. daughter and her associates were all executed for their crimes, with Julia of course, the front face of the crime's publicity. The execution would have been conducted in public, possibly in the town square, drawing a large crowd. The method of execution for Tofana and her associates is not definitively recorded, but common methods of the time included hanging, beheading or burning at the stake. The choice of method often reflected the nature of the crime and the social status of the condemned. The church likely played a role in the proceedings, both in terms of moral judgment and the actual execution process. The finest execution would have stirred a complex mix of emotions among the populace. There would have been fear over the ease with which poison could have been administered, as well as a moral outrage over the sheer number of alleged murders especially as word of the story travelled outside of Italy. Even famous composer Wolfgang Amadeus Mozart, stricken with a sudden illness, was recorded as saying, I am sure that I have been poisoned. I cannot rid myself of this idea. Someone has given me Aquatofana 
and calculated the precise time of my death. Julie Dufana's story is a multi-faced narrative that continues to fascinate. It serves as a reminder of the darker aspects of history and the ongoing evolution of societal norms and gender equality. Her legacy endures as a symbol of both the desperation and the resilience of the human spirit.